Give it up for the hugglers one more time. And, and leading us tonight, we're just going to correct everything that Sue said over the last eight or nine weeks. That, that's what we're going to spend. No, we won't do that. Uh, but Rick, tell, tell Sue that we spent the first 20 minutes tonight just debunking everything that she said, okay? Um, just share, just let her know that that's what I, we did, okay? Now, tonight, we are going to make a transition for the next two weeks, and we're going to look at some of the pitfalls that our families can find themselves in that put strain on every facet of a home, uh, whether that's your marriage, whether that's your relationship with your kids, whether that's just internally. So two things we're going to look at. Tonight, we're going to talk about finances, possessions. Uh, what does the Bible have to say about those things, and how do we navigate that so that that doesn't become a major pitfall uh, for us to have a healthy home where we can honor the Lord and, and, and thrive as, as families. And then next week, we're going to look at another one that in a different way is equally as uh, destructive and that ourselves in. We can just wake up and all of a sudden we have a schedule with no margin and no way of no way to figure out how to get out of it. So what do we do? How do we deal with busyness uh, in in our homes? And and what is what does scripture say about our time and how we use our time? So that's the next two weeks. And then we we kind of do a race uh, through the rest of April into May looking at just parenting issues. What does God's word have to say to us as parents about, or even grandparents, right? This is going to be good uh, as grandparents in the room to be able to pour into your, your kids and, and even help influence how, how they are, coach them a little bit. So we got some really good weeks coming up, but tonight for the first little bit here, I'm going to turn it over to someone, another blessing in our church, Rick and Sue, incredible resource to our church in the area of marriage. Carol Woodward is equally as much of a blessing to our church when it comes to her passion for helping people manage money and how they how you deal with money. So she has led several classes for us, helping people um, get out of debt, helping them learn how to have their money work for them and not against them, all those kinds of things. And so I've asked her to come for the first little bit and share uh, some principles to tease something coming up this fall and just to tell a little bit of her story. So Carol, come on up here. Would you guys make Carol Woodward feel welcome? Here's a microphone for you, and Thank I'm going to hand this off to you and hey. teach us, Miss Carol. So I'm not used to standing up in front of a lot of people, even though I talk to people all day long. Uh, background. Uh, we've been in Texas now for 16 years. Um, when we came to Texas, uh, we brought all our debt with us. Um, we had $330,000 330, in debt. Um, about two years after we got here, um, we attended our first financial peace class. Um, and back then it was 14 weeks long, now it's nine. But it still works. And we decided that it was time for us to make a life-changing decision, not just for ourselves, but because God commands it. Pretty simple. So um, we had a plastectomy, and you should figure that out. <laughs> Cut up all our credit cards. Um, we had over $100,000 over $100, in credit card debt. And we decided, okay, we're going to be serious. We sold cars, boats, RVs trailers, houses, exercise equipment, and if my kids had probably stood still long enough, they would have gone too. <laughs> it took us, it was, it was very difficult. The, qu the, the question that always came up was, ooh, ooh I want that, or ooh, what would Dave say? What would Dave say? Which got real annoying. Um, and you're going to understand why. I am a free spirit, and we're going to take that test sh shortly. But anyways, it took us 18 months to become debt free. We, now, that's not the norm. That was us on steroids. Okay, that's not the norm and everything. But we had just come to a point in our life where we were just done with it. So that's our story. That's kind of 
why we are so passionate about it. We know what it does to relationships. We know what it does to family. Um, we changed the legacy of our boys. Mine are 39 and 36. Dars are older, that's all I'll say. <laughs> and um, because they've all been through it. So it, it changes their legacy, it changes their lives so that they can live that debt-free and a godly life as well. So hang on. Um, it is very exciting to be able to go do that debt screen. And coming this fall, we don't have the dates yet, we're going to be having a financial peace class here at, at the church. Um, and we just, we have a blast, guys. Um, it's very um, transparent. It's very... What goes on in the class stays in the class, just so you know that. Um, I want you guys to look at this lovely quiz we have right here. And if your spouses are here, you be, one of you be person one, one of you be person two. Go ahead and start filling that out. And even if you don't have a significant other, you can still fill it out and find out what you are, either a nerd or, or a Free did, spirit. Did everybody get handouts when you came in? It's page. It's the first two pages of yeah, your handout. First two pages. So if you didn't get a handout, you have no clue what we're talking about. <laughs> All right, take the quiz. Okay, everybody done? Pretty much. No. Yes, you're good. Okay. Okay. Uh, show of hands. How many nerds do I have in here? Nerds. How many nerds? Okay, a nerd, you know, your scores are, if you have a four to eight, you're a nerdish. You know, if you're an ultra nerd, then you, you know, you cancel your plans with your friends so that you can start drafting your month monthly budget. I don't know about that, but anyways. Okay, how many free spirits? How many free spirits? Okay. So, when it comes to the, between the nerd and the free spirit, our nerd is the one who likes to do the accounting. The, they're the ones who like to do the budget. They're the ones who like to put all the little, the, you know, they, they thank you for helping to participate even though they really don't want you to. Um, and um, they show the budget to the free spirit and basically tell you to be quiet, okay? On the free spirit, you have to come to the budget meeting and you have to have input, which, you know, and the input can't be whatever. That's a good line. I like that line. And you have to have an opinion. When we get into this in, into class, um, we, one of the assignments is you have to do a budget and you have to do it together. Is anybody willing to say that they have a budget and they sit down every month and do it together? I know you. I know Kyle, and I know <laughs> Rob does only because they've been in class. That's why I know that. <laughs> okay, it's it's can be a foreign thing, and it doesn't mean that you have to do it when you're first marriage. You can start anytime, anytime, and everything. So um, okay, so now you guys know that. Okay, so um, we have different baby steps, as you can see. They have seven baby steps and then we have five other weeks that um, that we go over. Um, it starts as simple as um, an emergency fund. Kyle, what is an emergency fund? Just the first, very first emergency fund. How many of you, well, some of you may, in your budgets, you plan to get new tires? Okay, he does. Okay, good. How many of you plan for that flat tire? Yeah. So those are the kind of things we're talking about. Going out and buying a new pair of shoes or a new gun, and I did both sides to that, is not an emergency. Okay, just so you know that. So... Um, the idea, ideal is to, when we first start class, is everybody works towards 
their first emergency fund, which is $1,000 in cash that's easily accessible, okay? Just so you know. And then we go on from there. Next one is paying off your debt, and we go over how to use that and how to do snowball. Um, everybody always thinks it's pay off the one with the lowest interest rate. It's pay off the one with the lowest balance. Okay, we want that win. We want to see that win. Okay? Um, the third one, you're going to start saving for a fully funded emergency fund, um, three to six months. I know that seems sometimes like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of money. So if you know what your expenses are, if they're five, $6,000 a month, you can do the math and everything. Um, being in the type of job that I'm in, and most of you know what I do for a living, I'm a realtor. I, yes, I get a paycheck every month. I don't. So we have to have a fully funded emergency fund, you understand? Okay. Um, next, invest 15% of your household into, for your retirement. We go over saving for your children's college. We have a real good cheat sheet for you guys on that. Pay your home off early. Build wealth and give, which is a blast. So much fun. Okay, and then, so you'll see how it goes. Our first week is the baby, baby step one, baby step two, baby step three. And then we do four, five, six, and seven together in one week. And then we go over wise spending. The dreaded insurance, we talk about homeowner's insurance, we talk about life insurance, we talk about all different medical insurance, we talk about it all, okay? Um, building wealth, buying or selling your home, we have a little pretty good input on that. And then giving generously, okay? Any questions before we go on? We're almost done. Okay? I just threw this in here for you guys to get... Just a quick overview of this. We have two scenarios, Jack and Blake. Jack starts saving and putting away $200 a month from the age of 21 to 30. You can see the difference. And at age of 30, he stops. But yet, Blake, he starts at 30 and continues until he's 67 years old. So this is where compound interest works. So just imagine if you started with a grandchild, a child, putting $100 a month away until they turned 21 or 30. Well, they would, you know, if they put it back until they even graduate from high school, they're going to be able to fund their whole college, hopefully. So, any other questions? That's it, guys. I don't have a whole lot. Daniel's really going to give you the meat and potatoes. But please, if you're interested in going to Financial Peace or signing up for Financial Peace, let us know. There is a fee involved for your books and um, some of your software and everything, um, anywhere between $80 and $100, depending on what version you get. And then, um, but don't let that stop you. If, if it's a financial burden, just let the church know, and we can... Um, talk to you about that too. Also, just so you know, um, if you ever have a situation where you just need to bounce something off of someone, when it comes to finances, um, we are certified Dave Ramsey Financial Coaches. So that if you've got a question, we'll give you our opinion, and then it's, it's up to you what you want to do. So. Well, can you guys give Carol a, a round of applause and say thank you. Thank you so much. And I do hope that if you have not been through financial peace, uh, that you, thank you, um, that you would go through that on, it's going to be on Wednesday nights. It will be in the fall. And so as we get closer to summer and we start advertising, our fall schedule, it will be in there. So, and I'll reiterate what she said. If the cost associated for the materials is an issue, we don't want uh, that to prohibit anybody from getting these tools uh, to be able to, to help your family. So please let us know and we will find scholarships to be able to make sure that you could go through, uh, go through financial peace if that's something that 
that you know you need to do and you're interested in doing. Okay, Carol, thank you again so much. Um, and we're watching, by the way. Carol brought us um, a couple of books to give away, like freebies here. For So we're watching for the people who pay the closest attention, Jason. So help me watch and... We're each going to give, we're going to give away a book here at the end of the night uh, to the people who are the best listeners. So the best listeners or participants. So are you? check, 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 check. There we, there we go. go. All right. <laughs> strike one. Mike. The strike book's one. not looking good for you, Mike. <laughs> All right. Well, so what we want to do for the remainder of the time that we have is talk about what scripture has to say about possessions, about wealth, about stewardship. Let's get a biblical framework for that to help us understand why this is such a big deal, because scripture has a whole lot to say about it. Uh, First thing I want us to do, I found this fascinating when I was looking at this. Back in 1997, um, PBS came out with a special called affluenza or affluenza talking about the dangers of what they called uh, an epidemic of materialism and the damaging effects it has it's had in american culture and look at some of the statistics that they that they found and this is back in 1997 the average american shops six hours a week but spends 45 minutes a week playing with their kids Um, by age 20 we have seen one million commercials uh, with social media. The, social media wasn't even a thing then. So can you imagine that number? Uh, might, might have gone up. It might have increased just a little bit. And maybe it's the average American shops online for how many hours um, a week now. More Americans in nine, in the, at this time declared bankruptcy than graduated from college. And 90% of divorce cases, arguments about money played a prominent role in, in the issues in the home. So this is a big deal. Yeah, and, th- and that stat has held. I, I would say yeah. from, from all current stats I've seen about divorce, uh, sex, and money. Yeah, those are, the, those are the biggies. I don't know that I've ever had a, a marriage counseling that those were, that wasn't one of the two reasons, if not both sometimes. So huge stress in, in the home. Uh, and so this, this lure of possessions, that, that this idea that our culture presents us that, that the more you have, the happier you will be. You see some of those quotes that are underneath the stats, they're not up here on the screen, but you have them in your handout. Um, some of these you may have heard uh, in the past, but look at some of these, uh, some of the wealthiest people in their, in their era, in their generation. W.H. Vanderbilt, the care of $200 million is enough to kill anyone. There is no pleasure in it. Um, John Astor, I'm the most miserable man on earth. Uh, Rockefeller, I've made many millions, but they have brought me no happiness. Andrew Carnegie, millionaires seldom smile. And Henry Ford, I was happier when doing a mechanic's job. Um, So even some of the people who had it all, and they could have told you, does it satisfy, right? Does chasing after possessions get you what they promise? They all say no. And I know you were looking at some stats. Yeah, there's even been a a number of actually extensive studies done on this. What, What is the relationship of happiness to income? And uh, up to a particular point, as your income increases, your happiness increases. And that point is somewhere around seventy-five to hundred thousand uh, dollars. It's kind of gone up over the last couple of years, uh, you know, inflation and stuff. That said, once you reach a an appropriate level of wage where you're not um, where you're not in poverty, the happiness scale plateaus and it falls off dramatically. 
Okay? Extensive studies that have been done on this. In other words, that aspect of our finances that we all dream about, we dream about the gravy stuff. Not, not that just getting by and eating and having a normal lifestyle, right? So yes, have increasing in your job and finances to get to, to that point, but we always dream about just all the extras, those boats and RVs that Carol talked about selling and, and a lot. You dream about all of that stuff, but in reality, just the absolute statistics, it, it doesn't lead to happiness. It leads to greatly diminish satisfaction. And there's a reason for it. We, we were talking about that, and that's what we're going to uh, press into here. I don't know if we're going to steal our own thunder, but I'm stealing okay. your thunder. Uh, but it's... Um, it. uh, you know, I genuinely think, because we're spiritual beings, um, and yet uh, with more affluence, uh, it's so easy for us to uh, shove to pursue something else rather than, yeah. than the Lord and, and to have that spiritual hunger, but to just, but to just quickly turn to material possessions, just stuff, right? You, yeah. you can have a spiritual ache and a longing in your heart and be like, well, a new pair of shoes will satisfy me for at least, you know, a week sort of deal. And, and we do that. And that's what all the statistics actually pan out. Yeah. I mean, this, that's why we said it's, it's obsession with, with possessions, right? It, it can be an addiction, right? I just, I'm just, if I can just get this next thing, then, then that's going to be the thing that pushes me over the edge to just bliss and peace and, and contentment. And then I can get on with life, but I just got to get here, but we never get there. Uh, and you've got statistics, you've got testimonies of people who the world would have said got there, but they're telling you I never got there. But we don't even have to look at that. We can just go to God's word. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, uh, the preacher, as he calls himself and in Ecclesiastes, he looks into what he says. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. And so each of these verses, is, I've kind of given you, what, what is he saying in this verse? The more you have, the more you want, and the more you have, the less you're satisfied. Verse 11, when goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? The more you have, the more people come after it. The more you have, the more you realize it does you no good. Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. Uh, the more you have, the more you have to worry about. Uh, there's a story in a book. Randy Alcorn wrote a book called The Treasure Principle. Uh, and some of the, what you've got in front of you today actually comes from that book. And he said he was sitting in an airport on the way to speak somewhere. And he was talking to this very wealthy man who had uh, a private jet. He had vacation homes. And he was sitting there just looking so downcast. And so they were having this conversation and the guy said, I thought I was finally going to get a weekend to just relax. And he says, but my home in Florida had an emergency and now I've got to go deal with it. And he was just, it just struck him. He's like, this guy like worked so hard to get stuff. Got an extra home. Yeah. And now his stuff is running his life and there's no joy. There's no happiness in it, right? Solomon uh, or, or the preacher uh, said this very thing right here. Um, verse 13, there is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. The more you have, the more you can hurt yourself by holding on to it. Mm. Those riches were lost in a bad venture, and he is a father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. The more you have, the more you have to lose. Verse 15, as he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. The more you have, here's the reality, the more you'll leave behind. All right, so, so even God's word gives warnings about the lure of possessions, but how, how they don't satisfy um, in the least. And so we want to take a few minutes here 
to just kind of walk through a, a biblical theology. What does God's word say when you look at it as a whole? When you trace this thread, everything the Bible says about wealth and possessions is telling a story. It's giving us a, a message. So when we look at it as a whole, what are some of those things Scripture is trying to tell us about wealth and possessions that would be very helpful for us in, in our daily lives if we apply uh, God's Word to our lives? So we're going to walk through these. Yeah, because one of the things we... we it's, it's fair to give the warnings of Scripture, and, and we're, uh, we're prone to do that, particularly with money, give the warning uh, of the pitfall of materialism. Um, but that's not the, the only flavor that we want to give you guys tonight. We want you to look at, at the whole of the Bible and, and actually say, hey, the, the Bible has much to say about wealth, and it's not all browbeating like, let go of your stuff. It's, it, it has much to say. So we want to give you a, a full picture. Yeah. And so any of you guys were with us, it's probably been a year ago now, when we did the thread study uh, in the worship center. Remember when we did that, that study? That was biblical theology. We were, we were pulling threads that were pointing to Jesus. And so we're going to do that, but here with this, this idea of wealth and possessions. But Pastor Jason and I are not going to do it. You're going to do it. Okay, we're going to give you some of these principles, but we want you to help us holler out scriptures or examples in scripture, people in scripture that that we would that we would use to support these principles that you have in your notes. So you've got a page here with five of them with some blanks. This is so as we're talking, you can fill in some of this biblical theology on wealth and possession. So this is going to be audience participation. So maybe this is how you get a book. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. All right, first one. Material possessions are a good gift from God meant for his people to enjoy. This is one of the threads we would see about wealth and possessions. What yeah. would we look to in Scripture to see this? Yeah, do you guys believe that? Is this a true statement about the Bible? All right. Carol says yes. Give us some biblical support. Who, uh, yeah, holler Who are some people? Yes, yes, that yes. Quick. That, that was, was good. Quick, Danny. All right. You get Job. a book. <laughs> Job. Let's pause and think about Job for a second. What, what can we learn about Job? Yeah. Well, well, we'll start. Where did Job start? He had it all. He, he, he was the wealthiest man in his entire region. Okay. Yes, he's a story of suffering, so we can learn about Job and his suffering. But when you look at it through the lens of possessions... Okay, um, once the testing and the suffering was over, uh, what did God do? Yeah, he gave him a double portion, right? He had, he had that and more. So it wasn't the possessions that were even an issue in Job's life. So yes, Job was a wealthy man. Yeah. You said Abraham? Uh, David? We mentioned David. Who else? Matthew? Matthew, a tax collector? Yeah. King Solomon. Solomon? Wealthiest man alive in his generation. Um, Zacchaeus? We're going to talk about him in another one of these in a minute, so hold his name because he will come up again, I bet, in your mind as an example. What about in the... Um, what about in the book of Acts? We spent a year going through the book of Acts. Do we see any examples of how possessions were a good gift from God for his people to enjoy or to use for, for good? Can you think of any? You're hurting my heart a whole year and a half. <laughs> That's right. It was over a year, wasn't it? Year and a half. Year and a half. My people know nothing about the book of Acts. I learned a lot about the book of Acts, <laughs> Pastor Jason. <laughs> All right, that's, that's great. That's a great one, yeah. Uh, Paul lived off of um, the support of some of the churches um, that, would, that would sponsor his ministry. So yes, uh, Missionaries, churches were planted as a result of people who were generous with what God had given them, almost, and some even sacrificially generous with, uh, with what they had. 
Let me give you a hint. Did churches in the book of Acts have buildings like this that they met in? Where did they meet? Homes. Homes. So would there have been people who God had blessed with, with wealth who had large homes that would open their homes and allow churches to meet for people to worship and read the word of God and pray together? Yes, that's a blessing of wealth that we see in the New Testament. That's good. All right. That's a good one for the first one. Good job. That's your practice one. So now let's look at the what, next. What? Oh, you got one. What about Barnabas? You guys remember Barnabas? This is the part that hurts my heart. I wish you would have said Barnabas, guys. Barnabas. He had, uh, he had land as a Levite. Um, Levites don't have land, but he had land, and he sold it, and he, and he laid it at the apostles' feet for the redistribution for, for his purposes, just so that they could meet the needs of, of the needy people in the church. So that's a huge one. Yeah. Is it giving all of the gifts of the Spirit to him? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and giving is... Uh, is a particular gift of the Spirit. So um, we're all called to give, uh, and yet uh, there are those that have a particular form of giving, and that shows up in the gifts of the Spirit. Yeah, just, just you know, the joy they get uh, from being generous, right? It's a, it's a, it is. It is the Holy Spirit uh, in us, right? That, that's one of those gospel-focused ideas here that even when it comes to our possessions and how we use our money, uh, the gospel gives, um, gives direction for us in that regard, right? That the Spirit brings freedom. It gives life, right? We recognize as those who have been saved all that we have been given by God. And so the Spirit of God in us, who is such a giving, generous, extravagant God, would naturally, for those who have been saved uh, and are the temple of the Spirit, would be generous people who, who use the things God has blessed them with to, to bless others. So that's, that's very true. Yes. The, the woman who gave the, the, two, the two talents, the two Yeah, the widow's mites. mites. Yes. Yeah. Um, and what did Jesus say about her? She gave more than anyone else, right? She gave the most because she gave out of her, out of her poverty, right? Uh, she gave, she had nothing and she gave it all. Um, so yes, but possessions, right? They're, they're not inherently bad. They can absolutely be a gift from God. And we see that in scripture. Uh, but the next principle that you see uh, in here, material possessions simultaneously are one of the primary means of turning hearts away from God. So they can be used for good, but they can also be the thing that pulls, pulls us away, turns our hearts away from God. Help populate this. Where would we get this statement as you think through the entirety of Scripture? What are examples of this? Yes, sir. <laughs> In scripture, in scripture, <laughs> that got that got personal right there. That was <laughs> that was modern day hit. <laughs> yeah, great, yeah. great. Okay, if you couldn't hear, he said the rich young ruler, really powerful um, in Matthew nineteen, where um, it, he's he's seeking um, he. He comes, he finds Jesus, but Jesus can see his heart, right? And he immediately gets right to it, and he says, go sell all you possess. And says he, he left with much sorrow, didn't follow Jesus because he had much possessions. Yeah. Eric? Uh, King David. Yeah. King David. He's on both lists. <laughs> Who else from our first list is on this second list? Ananias and Sapphira? Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Yeah, their greed, they lied to the Holy Spirit, and it did not end well. Um, Eric said Solomon. Yeah. Right? The richest man in his entire uh, world at that time, yeah. and yet what do we know happened to Solomon? It let his... Sex and money. Let him Those astray. two things. Yes. 
And you see, you see both of those in his life, right? He starts out with this heart for God that says, God, I just want, to, I want wisdom to lead your people well. And God says, okay, I'm going to give you wisdom, but I'm going to give you wealth as well. And, and the wealth ended up um, just destroying his life. David, some of David's gravest mistakes that cost him dearly were because uh, just living in luxury and just kind of resting on his wealth uh, it turned his heart from the Lord in those moments and would have been the biggest regrets of David's life. And it's not just the adultery with Bathsheba, right? There's other times like when he took a census because he wanted to know just how powerful and wealthy he actually was. Mm -hmm. uh, and it cost his whole nation as a result of that. So both of those guys would be examples. Can you think of any others? But Adam and Eve? Hmm. Did they want something they weren't supposed to? <laughs> yeah, yeah, excellent. If you couldn't hear the money changers in the temple, right? They're, they're there and, and it's changed the entire culture and atmosphere. And Jesus goes in with righteous anger and is like, guys, my house should be called a house of prayer. That's great. Yeah. All through the book of Proverbs, there are warnings about the, the trappings of wealth and ill-gotten gain. Um, the, the prophets, especially the minor prophets, there are warnings to the kings of Judah and, and then the northern kingdom of Israel, warnings to those kings that the Bible calls wicked. And one of the indictments on those kings was that they were, they were fleecing their own people uh, for their own selfish gain. Um, and so we see these patterns all through, all through Scripture. Um, um, scripture, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the love of money. Yeah, the love of money is, is the root of uh, all kinds of evil. Yeah, just a, a fun, fun fact. You may know this. Uh, if you were to take all of the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels uh, and you were to categorize them topically, 15% of all of Jesus' teaching in the Gospels was on money and possessions. He taught more about money and possessions than he did about heaven and hell combined. So you think this is a, an important thing that we should, we should have a handle on and at least be aware that it can be a trapping mm. in, in our lives? All right, this is a good one. I love this one. I want to hear some good examples here. A necessary sign of a life in the process of being redeemed is that of transformation in the area of stewardship. In other words, when Jesus changes a heart and a life, we start to see a difference in the way they use what they've been given, uh, their possessions, their money, uh, their time. Give me some examples in Scripture of people who would fit this Zacchaeus, Matthew, others? Those are good ones. There's another Acts story. Paul for sure, right? Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's what I was thinking. You can look at Paul. You can look at Barnabas. Um, I'm trying to think of someone that was. There's the magicians. Oh yeah, yeah. And in, in Ephesus, you see, uh, you see that big time. Yeah, the in Ephesus, the magicians that got saved, they immediately took their books that were worth that were worth untold amount of of money in that day, and they burned them. Right, the thing that was making them wealthy, they said, it's of no value to me anymore um, because of the difference Christ had made in their life. So, yeah, that's great. So one of the principles I do want us to take away here, yes, we, having a plan, working through very practical ways for, for money not to be something we're enslaved to is absolutely important. Those are very practical, good things that we need to do. But one of the things we, you could start doing tonight, right? There's a pattern that we see in scripture, and we're going to see this in, in a minute as we keep going through here, right? If our heart desires the things of God, 
right? If we long for him, if we hunger and thirst after him, right, the stuff of this world will not satisfy us. So one of the best ways to kind of curb those cravings for <laughs> possessions is just to fall more in love with Jesus. Spending more time with him will be sometimes some of the best ways for us to get a handle on, on how we use our money and our resources. So, all right, um, we got to keep moving here. Another, th- another thing we see, there are certain extremes of wealth and poverty that are in and of themselves intolerable. So scripture speaks to this. Um, it, say, it sees things and it says, this is absolutely not good. This is, this is absolutely um, certain extremes. Can you think of any of those examples? Nabal, tell me about it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, you sat in the back. Uh, Yeah, King Herod. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Yeah, so, so he said uh, King Herod, and in part, even, uh, even the whole idea of asking for a king, uh, part, of, part of the pushback from the Lord is um, all of your wealth and your sons and your daughters are going to go and serve the king, like, like, God's like, I'm a better king. And then there's not this concentration of wealth that all goes to, to one person. So yeah. certainly the kings are going to be a massive abuse of, of wealth. And yeah. Yeah. The example Bob mentioned was uh, Nabal uh, in, in the life of David. As David and his men were running from Saul, they took shelter and hid uh, on Nabal's land, uh, and they were even helping care for it, and they just asked for something to eat, and, and he said, he said no, right? There's this, this greed and selfishness there, uh, and, and he didn't live much longer after that. David wanted to take his life himself, but uh, the Lord, uh, his men <laughs> persuaded him, that's not such a good idea, David, but the Lord, the Lord uh, executed judgment on, on Nabal for four for this area of greed and, and selfishness. Um, what about the children of Israel in the wilderness uh, when God was providing manna every day to supply their daily needs? What did they try to do? Yeah. Yes, exactly. There were very specific instructions. Take enough just for the day. Why did God, what was the lesson in that? He would provide. But what, did, what was their heart? The wickedness in their heart said, take extra. Like, I'll, I need to provide for me. I want more. I'll take more, right? And that didn't go well either, seeing a pattern develop here in, in, in Scripture. Um, some of the parables and teachings of Jesus speak to this. Right, the guy who tried to acquire more and more in his barns, he, and he got more. So what did he say? I'm going to do rather than give it away. I'm going to build bigger barns. And then what did Jesus say? You, you fool. Yeah, this very night your life will be required of you. Right? The stuff. Anything else on this one? Put you on the spot here. Keep thinking through all the kings that abused. I was thinking of. of Ahab, huh? Yeah, and Nebuchadnezzar would be an example. You guys remember when uh, uh, Ahaz wanted uh, wanted his neighbor's vineyard, um, and uh, the guy was like, "No, I'm not going to sell it to you." And then so he's like, "Well, I'm the king. I'm just going to take it from you." So he has the guy killed. Yeah. So we could look all through Scripture of examples of this one, but let's look at the last one here. And then we've got a little bit more we want to we cover tonight. Above all, the Bible's teachings about material, material possessions are intertwined with more spiritual matters. So in other words, Scripture doesn't just talk about um, 
money for the sake of money, possessions for the sake of possessions, it attaches it to a spiritual, a spiritual matter. Do you see that in scripture? We're telling you it's there, but where do we see that in scripture? It's in Psalms. God owns everything. Other? I mean, even like with the, the rich young ruler again, God saw that that man's heart was intertwined with his possessions, and he was trying to separate those two, and that it, it was going to be tough because it was, it was so entangled in his heart and what he wanted. Yeah, he's saying with, with the rich young ruler, uh, the, you know, the guy came up to follow Jesus, and, and Jesus knew that the heart was intertwined with possessions. Um, Matthew 6, Jesus says, you cannot serve God and money. You cannot have two masters. So you will either uh, serve one and hate the other, right? You can't have, you can't have both. Um, so Jesus is specifically saying that, yeah, that money is a spiritual matter. Yeah. Remember Jesus having to correct uh, the disciples uh, sometimes when they would see someone who was sick, uh, crippled, they would say, who sinned? Or someone who was poor, what did they do wrong? Or someone who was wealthy, they must be very godly because they have wealth, right? And, and Jesus constantly was having to, to pull that apart, says, no, like those two things aren't, <laughs> they're not connected. Sometimes there is a pattern that we see Right? There, there are those sometimes who are in extreme poverty because of choices, because it's, it, is a, it, is a, it is God getting their attention. Like the people of Israel at times would go through times where they were, they were destitute. Uh, I mean, there's graphic examples in the book of Ezekiel when they're talking about the, um, the, the, the bondage that they're going to be under, the captivity that's coming. He says, listen, you are going to be so poor you won't even have wood to cook your food. You're going to have to try to cook whatever food you can find over your own feces. Like that's how destitute you're going to be. And God says, I'm going to put you in that place to turn your heart back to me. So sometimes those things are linked together. We see that in scripture. Um, but to, to just automatically make those assumptions uh, that money equals godliness, poverty equals something's wrong in your life, right? That's not the teaching of scripture. I think we could also uh, talk about the parable of the talents, the three servants who were given two, five, and 10 talents, I think it was, and the ones with 10 and five went and invested it. They put that stuff to work. And so there's, there's a responsibility, there's a stewardship, a spiritual responsibility, I think, with what we've been given to handle that accordingly and not just to keep it, you know, be risk averse or faithless. Uh, in, in what we have yeah so with the parable of the talents and the use of uh, of of uh, one it's a question of stewardship but also a trust in a view of of the Lord your master the the final uh, the, the one who buried his talent was uh, he actually had little faith and he was afraid he did not know the master well and he uh, and so uh, out of his fear and his lack of faith, he buried his talent. So he didn't make good uh, stewardship, and he did not trust. And so there is that, uh, yeah. Um, in working through these parables, there's 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 some on both sides, and so the ability to think well about the point of scripture and to be able to tie our material possessions to heart issues um, that the Bible is constantly pressing, right? Jesus pressed issues of the heart, right? You think you're doing well because of this, but I want to know about your heart. Um, he, he constantly went to the heart issues. Yeah, the one thing we see throughout Scripture that is an indicator of your walk with Christ, right? your, your, your fellowship, your intimacy with God is generosity, yeah. It's not wealth and poverty. It's, how, it's your generosity. Um, the widow who gave her two mites, genero generous. Right? She didn't give financially as much as the one who gave all kinds of money, but Jesus, Jesus gets to the heart. 
and he says, but, but she was generous. This, this guy wasn't generous. This was a token for him. So generosity is the thing that I think for, for each of us, if we're thinking about like, what is a, what is a takeaway uh, for us? How do we know if, if in this area of, in our, in our home, in our, in, our, in, our, in our family, your personal walk with the Lord, right? It's, it's good to see how much control possessions and, and money have over you. Uh, a good way to test that is to say, how generous, uh, how generous am I? Um, how much am I wanting to hold on to as opposed to how much am I wanting to, to give away and bless others with? So. Yes, ma'am. So if you think God is comfortable, he's very comfortable. And the reason I can say that is um, he comes to the debt we have. Prior to that, I didn't want to break the deal. Bankrupt twice. Uh, money burned a hole in my pocket. Put it in, it came right out. Sorry. Uh, put, put money in my pocket, it would come right out. Okay? Once we came to terms that it's not ours, it's his, then he says, watch me bless you. But he also said, you know what, Carol? <laughs> you're going to be learning about finances, and you're going to turn around, and you're going to teach finances. <laughs> Talk to my mother. She thinks that's the most ridiculous thing she's ever heard because I was so <laughs> terrible with money growing up as a kid. Just, I mean, I used to sneak into my little sister's room and steal her allowance because I needed it. What? <laughs> so God has a sense of humor, but once you surrender and realize everything he gives you is his, he will help you get out of that debt, he will help your marriage heal in that area, whatever it is. Now, I'm not saying that once you start working on it together that you're not going to have trials because you will, because Satan doesn't want you sitting down and talking to the other person about finances and everything. Stay strong, and that's what you have these guys for, and that's what you have the programs for and everybody else for. You've got to lean into God's word when you're talking about money because it's his. It's not ours. That's good. Thank you. So that is a great segue into this last little section here that we're going to go through quickly. But I want you to go back and read these scriptures that you have in your notes. And then there's even some reflection questions that you can do throughout the week if you wish. But gospel-centered principles for stewarding our, our money, our wealth, and our possessions. What are some principles that we could say come from God's word that help us in this area the first one ties exactly to what Carol was just saying. A principle we need to remember, God owns everything. I'm just his money manager. Right, if we get into that habit of saying it's not mine, it's God's, is that a, does that change how we use it when we know it's his? Yeah, and so you've got passages there from Psalms, from Haggai, from First Chronicles that talk about it's all the Lord's. Everything is his. Um, the next principle, my heart always goes where I put God's money. Anybody give, just show a hands testimony to that, that my heart goes where I put money. Yeah. What is every geez? hand should be, every up. hand should it's go a biblical up. principle. <laughs> What does Jesus say? You've got the scripture there. Uh, it's on the slide. What does Matthew 6 say? Where your, there your heart will be also. Uh, doesn't get much. Um, so where does Jesus say? Where should we store up treasures? In heaven. Right. Which kind of leads into this third principle. Right. When we think about wealth and possessions, a lot of times when we think about building you know, a kingdom for ourselves, a lifestyle for ourselves. But what does scripture teach us? Heaven, not earth, is our home. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're awaiting his kingdom. I love this passage uh, in Hebrews 11. Right? We're just strangers here on earth, right? We're, we're just passing through um, sojourners. Um, when we think that way, it allows us to travel lightly, doesn't it? 
through life when we realize we're not trying to build uh, <laughs> a permanent residence here. Um, it's okay to enjoy it. Did God put us here? What was that first principle we saw in our biblical theology? Does God bless us with the ability to enjoy yes. wealth and possessions and, and, and go on vacations and, and enjoy, enjoy, enjoy things, you know? Yeah. And invent and uh, engineer, like create stuff. Some of you are handymen and you create really cool things at home. And, and you are like God in that. And God loves that. That's, that's why he made us the, the way that we are. And so it's, it's, not, it's, not an, it's not that we can't enjoy the creativity and the beauty that's here. Um, it's, um, it's remembering certain truths, right? That this world is not your home. All right. Any of you weirdos uh, unpack at a hotel? No, don't do it. Don't do it. Man, man, Gorham, good grief. I don't know why they put all those shelves. I yell at my kids for putting stuff in, in the drawers. I'm just going to leave it. You're going to forget gonna it. just going to leave it. That's the worst thing to ever do. Don't, don't do that. Everything in the suitcase. Depends on how long you're going to be there, right? If it's, if it's a week, I am packed too. Uh, if it's a night, no, it's staying in the suitcase. All right. But heaven, not earth, is our home, right? If we keep that perspective, some of these things, they're just principles for us. If we remind ourselves of these things, they're going to answer a lot of questions <laughs> for us and help us make a lot of decisions, just remembering some of these principles. I love this one. I should live not for the dot, but for the line. What in the world does that mean? It's having, <laughs> thank you for the honesty, Mike. <laughs> he goes, I don't know. <laughs> so in this analogy, this picture here, the dot represents the time all of us would spend on earth. Our entire existence is represented by the dot. But eternity is represented by the line that, that runs yeah. forever. Yeah, to give a, a illustration in the room, right? Imagine a string stretched from that line, that wall to that wall, and that represents eternity. Your, your life, your 70 years here on earth is the width of the tip of the pen. So don't live for the tip of the pen. Yeah. And, that's, yeah. and that, that, is, that is the trapping, that is the lie of... Of our, of our world that says, spend all of your time living for the dot, right? When that is, it's just a blip. Um, in scripture, you've got a couple of passages there that I thought would be excellent to meditate on, to help remind you of, you know, to, be, to think about how you live. Think carefully about how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Make the best use of the time, um, it's an important principle. Um, so, and then the last one, we've already touched on this some, but it's important to bring it up again here. Giving is the only antidote to materialism. You want to you wanna find, you want to think of a way to help you uh, think better about how you use what God's given you? Um, start Start being generous with it, and that will you will get you will get so much more blessing out of what you give away than what you keep. That that in and of itself will cure you uh, many many times of of a lifestyle that is more greedy, selfish, looking out for for gain. How many of you I would give testimony even just to show a hands to say I have always been blessed more by the things I have I have done for others than what I've done for myself. Yeah, like, I mean, every hand in the room would go up with that, with that statement um, there. So these are just some principles. Uh, we could think of others, but I think these five are good. These scriptures would be excellent for you just to continue to read. Like we said, all of these weeks are really just helping to give you some just a foundation to build on and to think about how these things affect you, your marriage, your, your family. Uh, what are things that, that would be helpful for you? What are helpful takeaways? That's what I want you to do over this next week. And so there's some reflection questions 
that you guys have. Um, we don't have time to do them in here tonight around the table, but I, but I hope uh, and pray that you would do these. Answer these questions honestly. Um, do them together. Do them as a family. The last question on there is, is a great one. What am I doing and what should I be doing to train my children uh, to, be, to be generous, uh, to think that way? Go ahead and be instilling that in the hearts of, of our kids, our grandkids. But some of these other questions are, are convicting, uh, as I even think through them. Right? Are my material assets competing with God for lordship in my life? Um, so... Just, it, it's some good questions to think about over the next few days. So hopefully this has been a helpful um, exercise for us just to think about one of those areas that if we don't, uh, if we're not intentional, it's something that will um, reach up and, and grab us and unknowingly it will become a slave to, to our possessions um, and our money rather than using it for God's glory. So... Pastor, would you pray for us? And Absolutely. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening and uh, uh, the ability to, uh, to gather together and to, to look and to think well about your word um, and the way that, that money affects our marriages and our home um, and these incredible principles. Uh, Father, that, that you are a God who loves to give good gifts and, and to bless uh, to bless for enjoyment. And so to see um, the gifts in our lives and the material possessions as a blessing from you, um, but to also be warned that the way that they, um, that we know material possessions, uh, they grab at our heart and they distract us uh, from, from you and from uh, seeking you and from finding our peace and our rest and our hope in you. And so, Father, we want to be generous people. We want to be people um, who steward your money and uh, who uh, invest in kingdom purposes uh, and come to the end of our lives and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And so I know all across this room, uh, we have, we're in different areas of life and different seasons and different finances. Um, Father, would you use this evening's discussion uh, to help further discussion and that your word um, and that your spirit would convict and equip us uh, to be able to walk out in freedom, uh, to walk with you, uh, with our possessions. Um, help anyone here that needs it to have uh, the courage to, uh, uh, to seek out help and wise counsel. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we got two books up here. How are we giving those away, Daniel? I'm kind of partial. Oh, I Your mic's off. My mic's off. I forgot about the book giveaway there. All right. I'm kind of partial to my namesake. He did a pretty good job of answering some questions tonight. So if I'm giving one away, I'm giving it to, uh, to my friend Daniel uh, in, in the back, back there. Oh, Danny. So, Danny. Yeah. I'm, I said my namesake. I'm going to give it. He gets a book. He gets a book. Uh, so then you've got a book to give away. Oh, okay. I'll, get, I'll let you give one away. That's, that's, my, that's who I'm giving one to. So. All right, good job. Um, Eric, you need this? Sure. All right, bud. There you go. You did well. All right. God bless you guys. Y'all have a great night. Hope to see you back next week, okay? And thank you to Carol.